Good morning to you. It is Thursday, November 17th. I'm Abby Huntsman. Draining the swamp and filling his cabinet, President-elect Donald Trump gearing up for another round of meetings today. So who is on the short list? Keep it here. Meanwhile, lefty New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio lashing, uh, blast, uh, bashing Trump right in front of Trump's house. We'll stand together. We're going to stand up for the needs of working people. We're going to stand up for our immigrant brothers and sisters. So are sanctuary cities in danger? We're going to take you inside that thorny issue. You mean illegal immigrant brothers and sisters, and he will be the 45th president of the United States. So why are people taking his name off their luxury high rise, I ask you? Hmm. Think about that for a second. Let me remind you of our slogan. Mornings are better with friends, and that'll be you. <laughs> It's the world's number one cable morning news show. Who's going to be on it today? Ooh, we've got a great guest list. We well, do. I hope to get the Go-Go's on live, but if we don't have the Go-Go's, let's who, go with Ted. Next? Ted Cruz sounds pretty nice. Also, our own Megan Kelly is joining the Curvy Couch this morning That's with her new book out. And Laura Ingram, just a few questions we want to ask some of those guests. Huh? No, uh, three big-time newsmakers. It's going to be great to see Ted Cruz uh, front and center at uh, 48th and 6th. Meanwhile, Donald Trump continuing to interview people. Uh, the who's who of Washington and business. A lot a lot of big names are walking in the Trump Tower, and the cameras are all trained on him, heading to, uh, uh, adding to the intrigue. Yeah, whoever goes in, you know, they wind up with all sorts of questions being asked. Oh, Mike Pence, uh, why would he be going upstairs? <laughs> no why would... idea. Here's who we know is going to be visiting today. Some, obviously, just to advise the president-elect. Others, perhaps, uh, have their hat and resume in hand. First up. Dr. Henry Kissinger. Isn't that an interesting one? Yeah. He's got quite the resume. What is he, 92 years old He's now. done it all. He 92 years Trump. old. But I do know that, uh, that uh, Donald Trump has spoken to him before, and of course he was very tight with Secretary of State uh, uh, Hillary Clinton. This is a bit of a surprise. Governor Nikki Haley, mm -hmm. uh, uh, considered a star on the right, but not really known for her international relations uh, uh, relationships, she's being considered reportedly for Secretary of State. She is. And you've got uh, Jeb Henserling being considered for Treasury. You've got uh, Governor Rick Scott dropping by today, Florida governor. Well, yeah. He apparently is not interested in a job. And then, uh, let's see, you've got, as well, you've got, it looks like Sarah Katz. Sarah Katz, General Jack Keene, who we have here all the time on the show. And uh, Mike Rogers, Admiral Mike Rogers. Right, NSA chief. And uh, finally, you got uh, Ken Blackwell, the former Cincinnati mayor. So a lot of people are going to be walking in the door at Trump Tower, and the assembled press is going to speculate, oh, there goes Sephra Katz, the CEO of Oracle. What could she be yeah, up for? because we love to speculate. But you yeah. know what is crazy to me is I, I was reading yesterday uh, articles criticizing uh, the so-called next Trump administration for not picking people soon enough. Here we are, Hurry. by the way, Hurry. we are, what, day eight or nine yeah. since the election day? And you look back at history and how quickly other past president-elects have picked their cabinet. Look at this. I mean, if you look, the earliest ready to go uh, would be two quick uh, mentions in week one. That was Bush 41 in 1988. And they were uh, Reagan and, holdovers. And, and two more in week two. But it's a lot easier when you were vice president to turn around and say, I'd like you to stay, you to stay, then you to stay. Uh, then look at Bill Clinton. It took quite a while, six weeks. Uh, Bush 43, who was as close to ready to go as anybody, even though there was a delay of game because of the hang up with the hanging chads. You know, right. he went one, six, and eight, but he didn't start till week six. And if you look at all those presidents, and we apologize. It is small print, but we want you to understand what's going on. Reagan, perhaps, is regarded on that list of presidents as perhaps the greatest of all of them. And if you will notice, he did not make the majority of his appointments to the cabinet until the sixth week, much like Bill Clinton. Maybe uh, President-elect Trump should just wait six weeks and drive everybody insane. Oh, he's doing happens. that right now. <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you what, it's interesting. Uh, for people to come out and say it's chaotic and there's, uh, and there's uh, just no one knows what's going on up in the Trump Tower, well, of course it's speculation would. that's insulting. Number one, hasn't he, after what he just pulled off in a year and a half run for the presidency and pulling off the biggest upset in modern uh, political history, get a little bit of benefit of the doubt that his management style seems to have worked out? What? And if things aren't going that well, like say, for Abby. example, 
example. Yeah, Check sure. him for a fever. Yeah. Brian, but, you know how the yeah. mainstream media works. They are going to make the Republican, they are going to make him look like he doesn't know what he's doing. Everything in chaos. But the New York Times said they're going to be a little more transparent. That's they're they're going to actually focus on all sides of the issues here. They said they're going to really take a step look, back and, and handle things differently going sure. forward. Let me show you what right? uh, what's going on with the mainstream media. For instance, uh, General Mike uh, Keene, uh, Mike Flynn is being considered for national security and Good Morning America actually got a great big exclusive, tweeted this out, President-elect, real Donald Trump, announces Lieutenant General Michael Flynn as his national security advisor. There's a problem. It was wrong. It was wrong. And you know, you don't usually count on Good Morning America's Twitter account to break the news. Usually <laughs> they're tweeting out their guests are going to have on the next morning or they're retweeting yeah. maybe something from the ABC account. So this alone, when I saw that, I'm like, that's unusual. So they Jason, were wrong. Yeah, Jason Williams was actually on with Megyn Kelly last night. He said, I'm just getting in my ear that uh, Lieutenant General Michael Flynn is the national security advisor uh, for, is going to be for President-elect Trump. And Jason Miller answered this way. Good Morning America is reporting uh, that the Lieutenant General Michael Flynn has been selected as a national security advisor. Is that true? Uh, no formal announcement uh, yet for that position. General Flynn met with uh, the president-elect today. Uh, he's been a, a companion on the campaign trail quite a bit, as we've seen uh, over the, the past few months. But are you he'd denying be, it? Can, will you deny it here? I'm saying he'd be a fantastic addition uh, to some work to the administration. I'll let the president-elect make that decision. When but are we going to get the decision? I'm a huge fan of General Flynn, and I'll leave that uh, any decision. You think tomorrow? The, I'll leave that to the president-elect. Look, he's probably going to get the job. It's just not announced right. yet. And then, of course, GMA amended their tweet saying... Well, he's yeah. just a contender for national security advisor for president-elect. So, you know, they sure. did walk it back, but I think it's a lesson to everybody. Just let's all take a deep breath, as Oprah reminded us last week. <laughs> let's be a little bit patient here. Yeah, she got in trouble out. for that. She did get in trouble for even saying <laughs> that. But, but also, he's never done this before. President-elect Trump has never run for president before. He's never been in this position. Let's, let's let him figure but, it out. But he has put together uh, management teams, and this is the ultimate management team, and he's a businessman, and he's going to do it right. And we've seen The Apprentice. I mean, that takes 13 weeks to wind up with a winner, doesn't it? But, you know, it's, it is very interesting that he went back on, you know, he went back. I think it's uh, today's headline is uh, back to draining the swamp. Mike Pence takes over on the transition team and says, uh, let's get rid of all the lobbyists. He does it. Mm -hmm. And then yesterday it comes out that anybody who jumps aboard the Trump train and becomes a member of the team will not be able to lobby for five years. So he's staying true to his word of what he exactly wants to accomplish. Also, some of the names he's bringing in there, Jamie Dimon evidently is That's getting another one. look as Secretary, Treasury Secretary. The word was, Dimon goes, I don't know if I'm qualified, right. even though he's got this great financial background. And of course, Henry McMaster, Lieutenant Governor, is looked at as mm -hmm. Attorney General. And I also think it would be very interesting to see what women get jobs, what uh, minorities get jobs. I think he's going to go out of his way to do that. Right. I don't think New York City lefty mayor Bill de Blasio showed up yesterday audition. Keep in mind when he was running for president in the United States last year, Donald Trump referred to him as the worst mayor in America. But then again, uh, Mr. de Blasio said that Mr. Trump was dangerous. Nonetheless, there is Mr. de Blasio coming out. He's a tall drink of water. You don't think anyone was speculating he might be on the new list for the administration? No, <laughs> maybe, yeah. I'm not sure, not. Abby. So, yeah. Maybe not. So what did he do? Well, he essentially went into Trump Tower and lectured the president about the, the sanctuary city that we're all sitting in right now. Listen to this. Just met with uh, President-elect Trump. And the purpose of the meeting was for me to assert to him the concerns and the needs of all New Yorkers. I thought it was very important particularly as the president-elect begins his transition for him to hear the voices of the people. And I reiterated to him that this city and so many cities around the country will do all we can to protect our residents and to make sure that families are not torn apart. I left the meeting with the door open for more dialogue. I reiterated to the president-elect that I would be open-minded as we continue substantive discussions, but I would also be vigilant. And I would be swift to react any time an action is taken that will undermine the people of New York City.
Right, and he'll use that power. Meanwhile, uh, it's kind of good that he's meeting with the Democrat. Evidently, Sir Chuck Schumer has called, uh, and they've spoken three times, uh, uh, Donald Trump, uh, President-elect, and uh, the soon-to-be, and now, I guess, yeah. officially, majority leader. I think that's important. The other problem is, locally, it probably doesn't affect you, is you can't get down Fifth Avenue. Right, and that's what... Right, uh, it's so true. That's so, the traffic is so <laughs> bad. That's the headline. Uh, Bill de Blasio said yesterday, uh, I will not tell you that Gucci and Tiffany are my central concerns in my life. I think he needs a reminder as to what makes money here in the city. Well, here's, here's the mean, thing. You think all the people so who work at Tiffany and Gucci and right. all those stores around there are the one percenters? No. Just a real disconnect. When I heard him absolutely. say that, I thought, are you the mayor of New York City? And just to give you context, that's what the kind of stores, it's a beautiful area of New York City, maybe the richest around, and there's Gucci stores, and, and uh, like you said, Steve, uh, Tiffany's there. So he just takes shots at people with money. All, it's nonstop. Tax them again. Well, so anyway, we'll keep you posted Someone else on who that. loves Tiffany's, like and, myself, and is money. our beautiful <laughs> Heather Now. <laughs> we all love Tiffany? I mean, who doesn't? Beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, good morning. Uh, Steve and Brian, I think, have some tips for us later on. <laughs> Uh, good morning to all of you. A couple of news headlines I want to bring you right now. First off, Hillary Clinton appearing at her first public concession speech, speaking at a Children's Defense Fund event. Clinton says that she was crushed by that election loss. Now, I will admit, coming here tonight wasn't the easiest thing for me. There have been a few times this past week when... Uh, all I wanted to do was just to curl up with a good book or our dogs and never leave the house again. Mm. Well, speaking of Hillary Clinton, civil rights leader Reverend Jesse Jackson calling on President Obama to pardon her about her private email server scandal before the president leaves office. Sir Clinton has not been legally accused, indicted, tried, or convicted of anything. President Obama should follow President Ford's example and offer a preemptive full pardon. It would be a monumental, moral, and political mistake to pursue the prosecution of Hillary Clinton. Talking to Rudy Giuliani about that a few days ago, and he said that is possible for the president to do. And now to Bernie Sanders. Last night, the former Democratic presidential candidate saying there is no way that he is responsible for Clinton's loss. Sanders telling the Washington Post, quote, I say to those critics, number one, that you can argue the exact reverse, that maybe I would have been elected president of the United States. He went on to say, if anything, his supporters, quote, helped strengthen Clinton's campaign. Well, one gold letter at a time. Actually, this is about uh, Donald Trump, the uh, name just removed from three apartment buildings in New York City. Residents who lived in the building started a petition to remove the names off of them as a way to protest Mr. Trump's presidential campaign. The building's management team claiming they are now adopting a neutral building identity that appeals to all current and future presidents. I wonder what that neutral one is going to look like. Really? Yeah, I think they pay a licensing fee to put Trump on the uh, outside. Yeah, so right. is that yeah, this good uh, financial business? Well, well, he shouldn't feel bad. George Washington was quoted as saying when asked why he was not going to go for a third term, he says, well, because of party politics, 50% uh, of the country would dislike me, and I don't want to get involved in that. So if Washington couldn't get 50% of the vote, Trump might have a hard time, too. Yeah, it's something neutral. It's like uh, would uh, college students call Z instead of he or she and all yeah. that stuff. It's like craziness. Mm. Many choices. Thank you, yeah. All right, Heather, thank you. Coming up on this Thursday, when the media said Texas was a toss-up, our next guest said, no way. He was right, and now he may have a spot in the Trump White House. Texas Agriculture Commissioner Sid Miller. Live next from Texas in that bag. Good morning, you, Ted. And there's brand new. Uh, there's a brand new plan in the works to make police departments more inclusive to potheads. When do you hear about this? The beginning and stood by it, even when the mainstream media said Trump would lose by a landslide. The polls are wrong. They're over. Oversampling Democrats from 8 to 16 percent. They're oversampling women, you know, 5 to 8 percent. Of course, they're undersampling Republicans, but there's 20 to 25 percent of electorate that have never voted before. And these are all mm -hmm. Donald Trump fans. There's really not anybody in Texas that's in the middle of the road. You know, we have a saying here, the only thing you find in Texas in the middle of the road is yellow stripes and dead armadillos. <laughs> Yes, right now from Texas is the Agriculture Commissioner down there, Sid Miller. Sid, you look like a genius. You were right. <laughs> well, thank you for once. 
<laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's right. All right. Uh, you know, since then, in the last couple of days, uh, your name has been rumored or suggested to be the next Secretary of Agriculture in a Donald Trump administration. Uh, I know you're on the phone calls with the transition team. Is that a job you'd be interested in? You know, any way I can serve my country, I'd certainly uh, certainly consider it. You know, it's one of those things you don't make a snap decision on. I'd want to pray about it, talk to my family about it, uh, but it, I'm certainly interested in it. Okay. I know you were on the uh, conference call with the transition team, Sean Spicer and uh, Jason Miller, I believe, yesterday. Uh, was there a headline out of that particular call to the various people all across the country listening in with suggestions? Well, I think the main thing that came out of that meeting, uh, you know, everyone was put on notice that anyone that would sign up to be part of the Trump administration would have to sign an agreement that they would not lobby for five years. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's helping drain the swamp right there. That's a good step. And that's exactly what the people want, right? I mean, they, they would like to see a leader go to Washington, D.C. and actually keep a promise or two. Well, well you know, people want their representatives to go up there and, and administration to go up there and do their job and not go up there trying to, you know, mm -hmm. pad their nest. And sure. I think that's a good move. Absolutely. I know a lot of the names right now are speculation, but ultimately, what was it that you were seeing from Texas that said to you, said to your gut, you know, Trump's going to win this thing? Well, it was just mainly the rallies. You know, uh, Donald mm -hmm. Trump, you could go to one of his rallies, there'd be, you know, 10,000 people, maximum capacity. There'd be another eight or 10,000 outside. And then you'd see a Clinton rally, and there'd be 1,000. Then right. you'd go to the next one, it'd be 20,000. Then she'd have 500. And it was just a surge of, of people that had really never been engaged before, hadn't been engaged for a, a long time. So it told me that these polls are couldn't possibly be right. So we researched them and found out, you know, that, they, that the polls were wrong. And sure. uh, eventually I was proven right. You were indeed. All right. Uh, Sid Miller, who is the Texas Agriculture Commissioner. Sid, thank you very much for joining us today from Austin, Texas. Thank you. All right. God bless. God bless you, sir. And God bless America. All right. Uh, 20 minutes after the top of the hour. Coming up on this Thursday, remember when the Obama administration spied on German Chancellor Angela Merkel? Why that is back in the headlines this morning. We're going to tell you why. And President-elect Trump taking a lot of heat for adding Steve Bannon to his team. But is the media telling the whole story? Of course not. So we're going to separate fact from fiction coming up next. say James Rackover, son of Jeffrey Rackover, hosted the party where 26-year-old Joseph Communal was last seen on a Saturday. Communal's body just discovered, discovered in a suitcase in a shallow grave in New Jersey. So sad. Brian, over to you. All right. Uh, thanks, Abby. Many are criticizing President-elect Donald Trump's choice of S uh, Steve Bannon as White House chief strategist. The Anti-Defamation League writing this, quote, it is a sad day when a man who presided over the premier website of the alt-right, a loose-knit group of white nationalists and unabashed anti-Semites and racists, is slated to be a senior staff member in the People's House. So, do these harsh claims have any validity? Here to weigh in is the president of the Zionist Organization of America, Morton Klein. Morton, you've heard the speculation, the rumors, the statements. What's your, what are your thoughts? <laughs> Look, uh... I'm the head of the oldest pro-Israel group in the United States, the ZOA, Zionist Organization of America. I'm a child of Holocaust survivors who lost virtually my whole family to vicious anti-Semitism and hatred during the Holocaust. <laughs> this is, ADL is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> you know, uh, in the 50s and 60s when hospitals and law firms were anti-Semitic, they wouldn't hire Jews to work there. <laughs> uh, uh, Steve Bannon has a number of Orthodox Jews who wear yarmulkes all day long uh, working for him. He has homosexuals working for him, gay people. <laughs> uh, Anti-Semites wouldn't do that. <laughs> and when we fought uh, campus anti-Semitism at City College, uh, Steve Bannon had his reporters calling City College repeatedly, calling Governor Cuomo repeatedly, how are you going to fight this anti-Semitism, do something about it. In fact, here's an article from uh, Bright, uh, his, his, his website, <laughs> BDS responsible for spike in anti-Semitism. Here's an article about swastikas being drawn uh, in New York City schools. An anti-Semite would not highlight such things. And when it comes to Israel, <laughs> every article about Israel is positive and supportive. The articles about the Palestinian Authority, uh, uh, it, uh, they expose the fact that the Palestinian Authority promotes hatred and violence against right. Jews, names schools and streets against Jews. 
This guy is the opposite of an anti-Semite. He's a strong supporter of Israel and a Zionist, and I find the ADL a disgrace, and we've asked him to apologize for this a disgraceful character assassination. Well, it's very interesting. I mean, Jeff Benedict, who I know quite well, who's uh, written various books, co-author, said he used to work over at Breitbart and left, but he says he's never had a problem with him, and he happens to be Jewish. Uh, Steve Bannon also, I guess people, some of his critics are referring to the fact that some stuff came out in his divorce proceedings, uh, but have not been verified. I want to bring up, uh, this is another prone point, that Donald Trump has a son-in-law who's Jewish and now has a daughter who converted to Judaism. If the son-in-law is playing such a prominent role in the campaign, which turned out to be a victorious one, why would he ever promote the hiring of Steve Bannon in, in the uh, primary process, in the electoral process, and now in the White House process? You, you're exactly right. He's, his son-in-law is an Orthodox Jew as is his daughter now, <laughs> and the people around him are the most pro-Israel people I've ever seen in any administration. Mike Pence, Rudy Giuliani, and Newt Gingrich, Mike Huckabee, Sheldon Adelson, an ardent Zionist, has given Trump $100 million. Do you think they would tolerate an anti-Semite uh, amongst them? Uh, it's completely uh, absurd. And even Alan Dershowitz, the liberal Democrat, supporter of Obama, has come out yesterday defending Bannon, saying this is an outrage, this is not anti-Semitism, they're demeaning, ADL is demeaning the word of anti-Semitism by accusing this pro-Israel, pro-Jewish man uh, uh, of this nonsense. Senator Bernie Sanders, who's as pro-Jewish as any Jewish person in the, uh, as who is very challenging to Israel on a regular basis, says that he wants uh, the president-elect to take Steve Bannon out of the mix. I don't see that really happening more. And also, you do have a three-month trial run. When he came aboard, is there anything anti-Semitic about the Trump run for the presidency, which ultimately won, uh, culminated in him winning? On the contrary, his platform is the most pro-Israel, the most pro-Israel platform of any party in history. <laughs> Why would he bring on an anti-Semite who wouldn't want to implement such a platform? <laughs> this is all partisan politics. This is all simply uh, uh, Democrats who want to harm the Republican Party right. and, and uh, ruin Trump's credibility. It's all about politics because they haven't said a word about Keith Ellison, who's up for being the head uh. of the Rep Democratic National Committee, a man who has called Israel an apartheid state, <laughs> said we shouldn't kill leaders of terrorists because they want to be martyrs, uh, a man who has taken money from Muslim Brotherhood affiliated people, who has taken money from CARE, who, who won't even condemn Hamas by name, and has spoken and got a to Muslim Farrakhan. Brotherhood affiliated people. Yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit later because it looks like he's going right. to be the next uh, DNC chair. More inclined, thanks so much. Thank you very much. All right, coming up straight ahead. One man has a message for the anti-Trump protesters. What are you protesting? The American political process, the Electoral College, the Constitution? No. You just didn't get your way. Get back in the Starbucks and yell about your latte order getting messed up. <laughs> uh, Chad Prather uh, joins us next. And there's brand new plans in the works to make police departments more inclusive to those who smoke pot. Turning the tables on those anti-Trump protesters. Yeah, there he is. Ride TV host and the man behind the video, Chad Prather. Chad, good to see you this morning. That video, I think good everyone, a right. lot of people watched and I thought, that's exactly how I've been feeling. So I was babysitting my nephew uh, last week and he threw a tantrum. He's two years old. And he didn't stop whining until I gave him what he wanted. And it, in a way, kind of reminded me of what's hmm. going on around this country. Of how many people even know what they're protesting, they're whining, they're complaining until they get whatever it is they want. Well, that's exactly what we're looking at, is people who are, you know, curled up in a fetal position, rocking back and forth, sucking their thumb, humming, Jesus loves me. They have no idea <laughs> what the process is all about or what they're doing or why they're mad. They just know that they don't feel right about it. And so why don't we take to the streets and, you know, damage property and chant words that we didn't even know what they meant three weeks ago, such as misogyny and, uh, you know, xenophobia. Well, but... Uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing to see in this culture these days with, with people who just don't feel good about sure. the situation. Chad, you know what's amazing is a lot of these teachers are compliant. Some of the high school teachers are saying, yeah, you can walk out now. You know, it's amazing the iPhone cameras are all there to send out. A lot of the professors, too, in colleges, same thing. They're pushing kids not only for hug rooms, but also to go out and protest. Like, for example, Rutgers yesterday, they announced there's going to be a protest. Here's what they were saying. 
It's not my president because he's disrespected people, my people. I'm, I'm black and Hispanic. He's disrespected my people, not even just racially my people, but my people as women. And I don't, I don't think that's fair to a country who's so, that's so diverse. I would say that we're pretty divided and a lot of people are terrified. But at the end of the day, he is our president. He's just not a president I like. Mm. What do you think about that? <laughs> Well, that last statement is absolutely true. He is your president. And, and everybody going around saying that Donald Trump is not my president, well, guess what? Hillary Clinton's not your president either. Mm -hmm. uh, regardless of what you think about it or feel about it, the reality of the matter is the electoral process worked in this country. It has for centuries. It hasn't changed. Sure. And we, we've received what we've gotten in Donald Trump. Let's face it. Uh, the Cleveland Indians played the Chicago Cubs in seven games of the World Series. They both scored 27 runs. Each, and guess what? The Cubs won. Now, sure. there are people could protest mm -hmm. and say, well, well, Cleveland got 27 runs, too, in seven games. Maybe they should share this title. <laughs> but that's not how the process works. It's not. Chad, I, in watching your whole uh, spiel there, I was struck by the fact that, you know, you, you ponder how we got to this, this stage where you've got all these snowflakes running loose on these uh, college <laughs> campuses. And you, you, you draw the conclusion that you, we have your generation, right. the parents of these kids, to blame. Explain for our audience what you're talking about. Well, and of course it wasn't meant to be an exhaustive treatise on the generational differences <laughs> because obviously there's various nuances there. But, you know, baby boomers were off doing their things. And a lot of times, it, it, you know, there was this latch key phenomena that was created with Generation X. Uh, a lot of times we fill the void of quality time with things in Generation X. Generation X wanted to do the exact opposite. They wanted to spend all the time with their kids and they wanted to nurture their kids. And they wanted to make sure their kids never heard the word no. And, and it went all the way to the point of not only giving them material things, but giving them emotional satisfaction. So these kids have gotten trophies for everything in life. Mm -hmm. uh, they've never heard the word no. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to feel good all of the time. And when something doesn't go your way, now they don't have a, the ability to process that. Right. Uh, how do I deal with disappointment? How do I deal with rejection? I don't have any ability. Uh, I don't have the inner uh, workings to know how to process that. So what do I do? I cry about it. And that's what we're facing today. Right. right. I'm just curious Spot to see on. if they would have that answer. If uh, D Donald Trump did say some controversial things along the way, I don't know if it's sure. all about him just uh, him winning. Well, and I'll be fair. Look, I've had people who have come back to me. You know, when I post these videos, people want to argue, and they say, you know, when Barack Obama won the presidency, people protested. I'm not condoning that either. Mm -hmm. If you're just whining because you're disappointed, that is not a First Amendment uh, protest. The First Amendment gives the opportunity to petition the government in the case of agreements. Just because Donald Trump is perceived as a big meanie does not mean you have a First Amendment grievance <laughs> right. to petition the government. Yeah, the big meanie argument. All right, uh, if folks yeah. would like to follow you on uh, the Internet, go to our website, foxandfriends.com, and we're going to link to your various videos. Yeah, and if you haven't seen your video yet, we showed you part of it, but you should definitely go find right. it. Impactful. Chad, good to see you this morning. Thanks for being here. You too. Thanks for having me on. Funny right. stuff. Let's toss over to Heather now for some headlines this All morning. Right. Good morning, In Heather. Meantime, Abby, if you're up for babysitting, I'm going to call you over to my yeah, house. Yeah, no. right. If, they, if they throw tantrums, morning. I just give them what they, they want. Give kids what they want when they have a temper <laughs> tantrum. Anyway, uh, good morning to all of you. Hope you're having a great day. President Barack Obama visiting his friend, German Chancellor Angela Merkel, for his last time in office. Things between the two certainly hitting a bit of a stag after she found out that the administration, the NSA, was spying on her. Spying on allies is a waste of energy in the end. We have so many problems, and I think we should concentrate on the essentials. All that seems to be water under the bridge now as President Obama lands in Berlin. The president also arriving hat in hand after assuring one of our closest allies that President-elect Donald Trump would not get elected. Well, one moment they were snorkeling, the next minute they were dead. Two French tourists both had heart attacks, we are told, off the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. They were 74 and 76 years old and both had pre-existing medical conditions. Some doctors say they may have gone into shock after being stung by tiny jellyfish that apparently sting 100 times more, uh, uh, more stronger than a cobra. A, a coroner is still working on official cause of death. And witnesses watching in horror as a hot air balloon makes a crash landing in a park that's packed with children in Philadelphia. That basket dragged across the ground, sending all four on board flying out. I thought it was about to crash into this tree. It landed, they all, everybody, whoever was in it, fell out. Well, the pilot first told police he was running out of fuel, but later backtracked, calling the landing standard. No one was hurt. 
And you have the right to remain stoned? Police departments across the country know he's going to join us on the couch next. Really? In the fall, Hillary Clinton is now blaming her election loss on the FBI, and our next guest points out that this episode only reflects a gross mismanagement of the country's top law enforcement agency. Yup, uh, look in the mirror, lady. Here to explain, Fox News a senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Good morning, Judge. Good morning, you, you heard her explanation, and it really bothered you. It bothered me. The, the criticism of the FBI, I think, is valid, and, and Comey has taken the FBI to a place where it doesn't belong. Its, it's once pristine reputation has been tarnished. But it is not the FBI's fault that this happened. It's Mrs. Clinton's fault. She failed. It, it, the evidence of her guilt is overwhelming, that she failed to secure state secrets. And the evidence that the FBI did not conduct a proper investigation is overwhelming. So why didn't the FBI conduct a proper investigation? Investigation yeah. because somebody somewhere north of Jim Comey said, we don't want her indicted. We want her exonerated, no matter what the evidence is against her. Why did the FBI reopen the investigation uh, 11 days before Election Day? Well, yeah. they found what they thought was a treasure trove of emails in Anthony Weiner's laptop. It turned not to be a treasure trove. What did the FBI do wrong? They didn't work with the Justice Department. They didn't have a grand jury. Without a grand jury, no subpoenas. Without a grand jury, no search warrants, because judges will say this is sure. not a serious uh, investigation. And then when he said, in the middle of the summer, we're not going to indict her, but proceeded to outline all the evidence against her. That means he, he should have indicted her. Correct. And he infuriated the agents, people that we all hear from, off the record. Yep in the investigation, why are you doing this to us, and why didn't you follow through sure. on what we gave? Do you think the outcome of the election would have been different had James Comey not come out two weeks before saying we're reopening this investigation? Mrs. Clinton uh, thinks that. I once thought that until election night. Mm -hmm. When I sat with the number crunchers over in the new uh, studio, and I could hear them saying, you know, Romney won this, this county by 5,000. Uh, Trump's got to win it by 7,000. Wait a minute, he's winning it by 25,000 over right. and over and over again in blue collar areas. Whatever you think of Donald uh, Trump, he struck the nerve sure. of the forgotten blue collar voter, forgotten by the government, forgotten by the Democrats, right. forgotten by the Obama administration. She was part of all of that. Sure. You know, Judge, it's one thing, and I'm sure, well, maybe President Trump will look into what happened to the IRS targeting of Tea Parties and whatnot, maybe. But, you know, just to think of what has happened with Hillary Clinton where it looks like the Department of Justice, as you have depicted, is a political wing of the White House, that's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking, and I wonder what President-elect Trump will do. Does he want a special prosecutor to investigate what the DOJ and the FBI did in the last year and a half of the Obama administration, or does he want to turn the page, forget about history, and move forward? I, I don't know what he's going to and do. And what happens with James Comey? My guess is he will have a different job a year from now. And Donald Trump hedged on that in a 60 Minutes interview. He says, we'll have to see. And rightly so, because he probably needs more information before he can make that decision. Judge, right. great to see you. Pleasure, guys. And you can get that column online, right? Yes, you can get it at foxnews.com and the Washington Times. I'm off to D.C. Uh, in an hour. All right, good to Very see you good. this morning. For a show tonight. All right, see you on okay. Special Report. You got it. Meanwhile, a roadside bomb took both of his legs in Afghanistan. Now he is Florida's newest member of Congress. So will he drain the swamp? like Donald Trump has promised. We're gonna to talk to Congressman-elect Brian Mass. Good morning, sir. You're next. A college graduate to pursue his next dream of being a congressman, Mass got to work and earned an economics degree from Harvard and then went on to win a congressional seat in the swing state of Florida. And joining us now is decorated Army War veteran and Florida Congressman elect Brian Mass. Good to see you this morning. Congratulations on the big win last week. Thank you. It's good to see you this morning. So we had you on, what, over a year ago, June 2015, when you announced that you were running for Congress. You know, a year and a half later, you've now won. Walk people through your incredible story. Six years ago, you were in Afghanistan, hit by a roadside bomb. Your life changed forever. It did. You know, I was uh, working under the cover of darkness in Afghanistan, special operations, 
Basically, I found one bomb too many. I was a bomb technician, and I woke up about a week later in Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And when I woke up in that hospital, I just I made the commitment to my wife that I wasn't going to let the best defense that I give our country be something that was behind me. And that's how I came to the idea of ultimately running for Congress one day to keep fighting, keep fighting for this place. Because a lot of people would say, why would you want to be in Washington? Nothing gets done there. It is corrupt. You know, as Donald Trump says, Donald Trump, uh, that you got to drain the swamp. Why did you want to do that? Why did you want to get to Washington and make a difference? It's exactly that reason. It's to come up here and fight in the way that we do it on the battlefield. If you're a soldier, if you're a service member from any branch of the military, when you go out onto the battlefield, you fight for this country. You don't fight for personal gain or, or anything else. You're fighting for the right reasons, and that has to be the way that you do it in Washington, D.C. The, the battle cry, drain the swamp, that's not about getting rid of everybody that works up here. It's about the way that you go about doing your business, getting rid of people up here that are going to be full of fear, that are not going to be strong, and, and making sure that we fill Washington, D.C. with people that serve selflessly and people that are strong and people that know how to fight for this place. Yeah, and something you're really passionate about, of course, is VA reform and changes that are needed there. Obviously, you're going to have the opportunity when you get to Washington. What do you hope to change? You know, the VA is servicing people that love this country so much that they were willing to give the last breath in their lungs. What they deserve back is love. And anybody that works at the VA that isn't giving them the love that they deserve, the care that they deserve, needs to be gotten rid of immediately. The, the veterans serviced by the VA, they deserve to receive care from anywhere that they want, whenever they want it, because their commitment was to serve every person across this land. It's what they deserve. It's what they have to have. If we're going to make the VA better and we're going to make the lives of veterans better. Yeah, you're talking so much about service. You've seen what's going on around this country right now. The protesters saying that, that President-elect Trump is not their president, some folks burning the American flag. What is your message to them as someone that has served overseas that now has worked his way up and has just won his own election? What is your message to them? You know, burning the American flag is not an act of activism. If you want to look at true activists, look at people out there like Pat Tillman, who left his career in the NFL, went out there and served with the Army Rangers, was willing to give his life. That is what true activism looks like. It's not disrespecting your country, your yeah. flag, something that so many service members uh, fought so hard to defend. Yeah, powerful message and an incredibly powerful story. Brian, good to have you here this morning. Congratulations Thank again. You. Good luck to you. Thank you. All right, coming up, are Democrats ready to say so long to Nancy Pelosi? Next hour, you're going to meet the man who could take her job as minority leader. And a huge show still had Senator Ted Cruz, Judge Alex Farrar, and Megyn Kelly. They are all going to join us right here live. Stick with us. It is Thursday, November 17th. I'm Abby Huntsman, and draining the swamp and filling his cabinet, President-elect Donald Trump gearing up for another round of meetings today. So who's on the short list? Keep it right here. Plus, they are protesting the election, but did they even bother to vote last Tuesday? I didn't even vote because I was so disillusioned, but I think this whole thing has just been a wake-up call to myself and to so many other people of my age, my age that are just disillusioned with politics. Look, if you don't vote, you really can't complain, can you? Coming up, a message for those protesters that you don't want to miss. Oh, wow. All right. Are Democrats ready to say so long to Nancy Pelosi? You're about to meet the man who could take her job as minority leader. Mm, pretty intriguing, right? Sit back, get dressed, because your mornings are better with friends. Cruz. We have lots to ask him about. Also, Megan Kelly is going to join the show. There's a new book out I hear. Yeah. yeah, it's excellent. And Laura Ingram's here. Man, not only is she always intriguing to talk to, she's got something to, uh, to think about. Yeah. And maybe being the next press secretary for Donald Trump. Something really big to think Indeed. about. And we've got Abby Huntsman today. Guys, it's good to be back. Was in Scranton, Pennsylvania the last couple days. Yes. Getting I, a real feel for the voters out there and how President-elect Donald Trump mm -hmm. won the important state of Pennsylvania. You've been all over the country in the last uh, couple of weeks. Flipping pancakes? Who's, I know how to flip a good pancake. Who's got the best home fries? Oh, that's a good one. Florida's got some good ones. Florida's, Florida's got some great. good ones. I love this. Uh, I asked Abby how it was at the diner. She goes, you know, I always wanted to be a waitress. And you, late. you look like oh, you look like you could be. I a feel woman. at home. Right. I really You're do. So Maybe they're just being nice, but but it's fun to get out there and talk right, to the voters. All right. All right. We do start here though. A series of high-profile meetings, as we were talking about, set for today with President-elect Donald Trump. Yeah. It's who's walking in the tower? And he's already taking steps to fulfill his campaign promise—that is, the president-elect—to drain the swamp. 
Rob Schmidt has been covering Donald Trump. He joins us live right now with brand new details about the day ahead as he looks for folks for his cabinet. That's right, guys. And in a city stock full of lobbyists, this is rough news for a lot of people in Washington, D.C. Donald Trump's Drain the Swamp slogan really connected with voters. And now many in D.C. vying for a White House position need to decide if they want to be a lobbyist or if they want to work for the president, because our next president will not let you do both. The new rule, if you join Mr. Trump in the White House, you are banned from being a lobbyist for five years as part of that agreement. His transition team says this is the first step of draining the swamp. President-elect Trump is working hard to lay the foundation for his cabinet with a series of high-profile meetings today. Some of the A-listers heading to Trump Tower in Manhattan. One-time rival, South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, who's now said to be a candidate for Secretary of State. Also former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, Florida Governor Rick Scott, and retired Lieutenant General Michael Flynn is reportedly the top contender to become Mr. Trump's national security advisor. No formal announcement uh, yet for that position. General Flynn met with uh, the president-elect today. Uh, he's been a, a companion on the campaign trail quite a bit, as we've seen uh, over the, the past few months. But are you he'd denying be, it? Can, will you deny it here? I'm saying he'd be a fantastic addition uh, to somewhere to the administration. I'll let the president-elect make that decision. When are um, we going to get the decision? I'm a huge fan of General Flynn, and I'll leave that uh, any decision. think tomorrow? The, I'll leave that to the president-elect. Going to be a wait and see. Earlier this week, Mr. Trump said today would be the soonest that he would announce his final White House team. And guys, I still can't get over seeing Ted Cruz walk into Trump Tower oh, over that, all that. That would have been great. Never thought yeah. that would happen. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Rob. I would miss General Jack Keane here, but man, would he be strong and does he have universal sure. respect from Democrats and Republicans? Both presidents kind of tapped into him over the last right. six, uh, He could last, still be a guest. Last 12 years. Sure. Yeah, I hope we return our calls. Here we are. We're a week and a half after the election. All we know for sure is that Rice Priebus is going to be his chief of staff, and we know that Steve Bannon is going to be his chief strategist. Everything else is speculation, and yet the mainstream media is making it seem like, man, this Trump guy, he doesn't know what he's doing. It's There's like a fantasy football draft. It's chaos exciting. over there. Exactly right. But when you look at the charts, and we, we've put together, our brain room has put together a chart of past presidential appointments. Far left, the number of weeks after they were elected. As you look, uh, Richard Nixon uh, made all of his selections in the sixth week. And then Carter, uh, forget about him. But then you go over to uh, Ronald Reagan. Most of his appointments came a month and a half after he was elected president. Meanwhile, the media is freaking out. I mean, they, they aren't... Not, Do you think? Not only are they just talking about this, they're, they're like in hysterics about the fact that we're, what, eight days past Election Day, he and he hasn't fight. picked one cabinet member. You know, someone I always love listening to is Charles Pouthammer on our sure. channel. He's one of those people that every time he opens his mouth, you have to stop and listen to everything he says. Here's what he said about this coverage. Take a listen. I think the, the, the coverage is slightly over the top, in fact. It's uh, remarkably over the top. First of all, as you showed in that chart, Historically, there's nothing unusual about not having made an announcement after one week and one day. Second, uh, the Trump campaign has been described as in disarray since about January, and he won the election. A third, uh, I don't think there's any question that if we come to Inauguration Day and we don't have, say, a Secretary of Commerce nominated, the foundations of the republic will not be threatened. He also says there's a swimsuit of uh, the portion of the show will be coming up shortly. Uh, some of the other names are kind of interesting. Governor Perry, who quickly went from adversary to ally, he's looking to be lined up as, uh, as energy secretary. Henry McMaster, possibly AG, along with our guest coming up shortly, Senator Ted Cruz. And they're trying to convince uh, Jamie Dimon to consider treasury secretary as well. They want the business people involved, and I think it's making Wall Street happy. Steve, you know better than me, but man, it seems like the stock market's going through the roof. Investors are elated by a, about right. a guy they were originally very, uh, yeah. uh, very on the fence with. Right, right after he was elected, the stock market futures on uh, Wednesday morning went down 700 points. But of course, we've since had a great big rise, one of the best in a very I long time. I thought what Krauthammer said, though, the middle point that he made was so spot on, is, is the media reported about his campaign being in disarray. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From January until Election Day, he ultimately won this election. He did. So yeah. people love to assume that everything is just chaotic behind the scenes. They don't know what they're doing. You know, President-elect Trump doesn't, he's never done this before. Yet, yeah. You just, know what? Uh, d uh, apparently Joe Biden didn't get the, the memo because yesterday he met with Mike Pence on the steps of the Naval Observatory where Mr. Pence is going to be living. And rather than 
you know, uh, go ahead and buy into the narrative by the mainstream media about everything's in chaos, it's going to be terrible. Joe Biden said, I am confident on day one, everything will be in good hands. He also he said they didn't know what they were doing when they got in there on day one. Apparently this is the reality of, of stepping into that It's a tough to job. job. I like the way Donald Trump's method of running things is this. I have a person in place. If they're not working out, I'll get a new person in place, and I'm going to march forward. I'm not afraid to make change. Hence, Governor Christie moved down to vice chair, and a lot of the lobbyists moved out. It's not a big deal. The lobbyists are out. A new person's in charge, and now we move forward. Mm -hmm. And he deserves the benefit of the doubt. He won. Yeah. Take a deep breath. Take a step back. So we've been following the protests Elections around have the consequences. They do. And we've been following these protests uh, around the country over the past week or so. And Rutgers University, the latest college to take to the streets, calling themselves a sanctuary campus. But the question is, do they even know what they're protesting? Take a look at some of the footage that we got. This is a, a fine example of how we need to come together to show support for everybody and everybody who's like, you know, going through situations where, you know, maybe they are in fear that, you know, their mom, their aunt, the family members might not be feel safe to be here anymore because, you know, a man is threatening to like, you know, send them back to wherever they came from, which is extremely disrespectful. I didn't even vote because I was so disillusioned, but I think this whole thing has just been a wake up call to myself and to so many other people of my age in my age that are just disillusioned with politics. I would say that we're pretty divided and a lot of people are terrified. To me, Rutgers is, should be a sanctuary campus because there are people from so many different backgrounds here. Schools and institutions, again, are places where people from all different backgrounds come together. So if that's not the case, then what's the purpose? I voted for Hillary Clinton. I'm as disappointed and um, upset as any any other person, but I think what we need to be prepared for is to bring pressure to bear against the administration if they try to do, uh, if they try to take action that's destructive or abusive. At the end of the day, he is our president. He's just not a president I like. And he's uh, on a TV show down in Dallas, and he had these observations about who those people on the campuses and elsewhere actually are. Well, that's exactly what we're looking at, is people who are, you know, curled up in a fetal position, rocking back and forth, sucking their thumb, humming, Jesus loves me. They have no idea what the process is all about or what they're doing or why they're mad. They just know that they don't feel right about it. And so why don't we take to the streets and, you know, damage property and chant words that we didn't even know what they meant three weeks ago, such as misogyny and, uh, you know, xenophobia. So these kids have gotten trophies for everything in life. Uh, they've never heard the word no. They're supposed to feel good all of the time. And when something doesn't go your way, now they don't have a, the ability to process that. Uh, wh how do I deal with disappointment? How do I deal with rejection? And I just think these ads, over $100 million in ads, making Donald Trump into a cartoon character, and some of his comments obviously didn't help, have made these, uh, made these students outraged. How can we elect this guy? When in reality, the people that know him say, you know, th th he ran a campaign to win, took no prisoners, like something we haven't seen before. But I never thought this reaction would still be happening. Yeah. This is over a week. You know what? It's getting cold, though. And they're not going to be outside when That's it's really a great cold. Point. We'll see how long this continues on. It's going to continue until the inauguration. There's going to be a big protest uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington. Yeah, well, I'm not sure what they want. On the 20th of January, and then I think it's. Going I don't know to be what they here. want out of it because whether they like, they like it or not, President Elect Trump is going to be the next president. It's the reality of it. Deal right. with it, folks. Let's go over to Heather now. Now with some headlines. Good morning, Heather. Good morning. Uh, we're talking about Hillary Clinton right now. As you were just talking about Donald Trump, she made her first public concession speech of sorts since her crushing loss to Donald Trump. Speaking at a Children's Defense Fund event, she says she is crushed by losing. Coming here tonight wasn't the easiest thing for me. There have been a few times this past week when uh, all I wanted to do was just to curl up with a good book or our dogs and never leave the house again. Well, in the meantime, civil rights leader Jesse Jackson calling on President Obama to pardon her about that private email server before he leaves office. Voter fraud concerns now plaguing the race for governor in North Carolina. It's still too close to call. The allegations come after local election officials discovered several hundred ballots may have been filled out by the very same person. Governor Pat McCrory is currently trailing his Democrat challenger, Roy Cooper, about 5,000 votes. McCrory facing political backlash since July when he signed that controversial bathroom bill. And a deadliest catch star beaten, robbed, and left for dead on the side of the road. Jake Harris, 22 years old, deckhand on the Cornelia Marine.
Well, that's Jake Harris. He's been hospitalized in intensive care with skull and brain injuries. He claims while driving home from a casino in Washington State, a man in the back seat of his car suddenly attacked him. He says he woke up on the side of the road without his wallet and his casino winnings. Those were both gone. Two suspects are now under arrest. And this may look like an ordinary skyscraper in New York City. Guys, you've noticed this one before? It turns out, though, that this building could be spying on you. It's referred to as the Long Line Building. It's in New York City. It was built back in 1974 to house AT&T's worldwide network. But according to an investigation by The Intercept, it actually houses an NSA surveillance mega center codenamed Titan Point. Millions of phone calls, faxes, and emails are allegedly intercepted daily. NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden even referred to it in leaked documents. If there's such a thing as still faxes going out these days. Hmm. It's such a crazy skyscraper, though, because there are no windows. I know. Yeah. We it's see that when we drive in through New York City. All right. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, coming up on this Thursday, is the Democrats' love affair with Nancy Pelosi finally about to be over? Up next, you're about to meet the man who could take her job as minority leader. And the Robertson family has some huge news about the future of Duck Dynasty. Did they just sign up for another season or call it quits? Right. That is Wait, are we on it? Uh, That soup was very, very good. <laughs> is that you guys? Yes, it was. <laughs> position may actually be in jeopardy as many Democrats question, is it time for a change? Ohio Congressman Tim Ryan is mulling a bid to challenge Nancy Pelosi. He joins us right now from our nation's capital. Good morning to you, Congressman. Good morning. Good morning. You know, a lot of people are looking in and saying after the, you know, she promised to pick up a bunch of seats <clears throat> so that you would be in the majority again. That didn't work out. Is it time for some new ideas? No question about it. I mean, it is time for a new direction, uh, a new way of doing business, a new Democratic Party, a Democratic Party 2.0, uh, in which you know we had a lot of people work really hard in this past election, and it, it didn't work out, and it hasn't worked out. It didn't work out in 10, it didn't work out in uh, 14, it didn't work out in 16. So it's time to look for a new way of doing it, and sure. you know I think there's a lot of people very interested in what the next version of the Democratic Party looks like. Sure. Was uh, was uh, Congresswoman Pelosi trying to scare you off yesterday when she said, <laughs> hey, I've got two thirds of the members of my caucus that are already behind me, so hey, and then I'm adding this part, Mr. Ryan, just run along. It, it, I've got it in the bag. Uh, well, you know, there's all kinds of gamesmanship happening here, but uh, you know, I'm an Irish fella, so I don't mind a good fight. Um, and you know, we're just going to see. We, you know, th this is not about me, and it's not about Nancy Pelosi. Right. It's about the caucus. It's sure. about the direction of the Democratic Party and the role we play in the United States of America. And I will tell you, if the Democratic Party is not strong, I believe that many, many interests can take over. Sure. Uh, what, what the best interests of average people are that are in Youngstown, Ohio, and right now we have. The the Republican Party that's controlling the House, the Senate, and the White House. And right. we need to hold them accountable for now governing. Sure. And the Republicans ran on, let's get more jobs. <clears throat> and, and, you know, your party had all sorts of things that uh, it put out there. It's time to refocus on things people care about, isn't it? I think that the message from the earthquake that happened on Tuesday was that we weren't talking about jobs and the economy right. and providing opportunity. The, the great blue firewall that was Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, Michigan, and almost even Minnesota uh, collapsed for us because we weren't talking about those lunch bucket issues. We talked too much about job retraining, uh, getting retrained to run a computer when our folks want to run a backhoe. They want to sure. sling concrete. And we got to talk to those people who take a shot hour after work, not those people that just take a shower before work. What a good point. All right. Interesting stuff. Uh, <laughs> Tim Ryan, who would like to be the House Minority Leader. Tim, thank you very much for joining us live today from Capitol Hill. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. What do you think about him? Email us, friends at foxnews.com. Meanwhile, still ahead on this Thursday, liberal mayors across the country vow to stay sanctuary cities. But can they do that? Judge Alex Ferrer here to weigh in next. of the Oval Office. Get this. Fox News contributor Carl Rove, who I've met in person, says President Obama's refusing to renovate the room, leaving security upgrades to Mr. Trump, so he's going to be forced to work across the street or at a stack table in the hall. Hmm. And that's really? a quick look at the news by the numbers. Thank you, Brian. All right, President Obama is weighing in on the future of his deferred action program. Listen.
I will urge uh, the president-elect and the incoming administration uh, to uh, think long and hard before they are um, endangering the status of what, uh, for all practical purposes, are American kids. But before President-elect Trump can take action, does President Obama have the power to pardon these illegal immigrants? And would he do it before he left? Let's talk to former Dade County, Florida Circuit County Judge. Wow, you threw Florida. county in there a bunch of times. I did. <laughs> the key is county. Yes. Uh, so could the President of the United States, before he exits, pardon, a blanket pardon for illegal. He could. Let, let, let me just say as a disclaimer, personally, I, I'm to, completely opposed to illegal immigration, but I, I do agree with the president on this because I've met children who, who were here, grew up with your kids, played at your house, went to school with your kids, and, and I had a little girl run up to me and say, well, can I be a lawyer even though I'm not here legally? And I said, well, someday, don't you think you'll be here legally? And, and her eyes just welled up. She's like 12 years old, and she goes, I don't think so. And it's just heartbreaking when you personalize, when you really meet them. Um, that being said, Legally, yes, he could pardon them. He could do a blanket pardon, just the same way that uh, President Carter pardoned all the draft dodgers. He could do it uh, all in unnamed individuals who violated this law. Or he could do it the way President um, Ford pardoned President Nixon with uh, crimes committed within these dates. However, it becomes very difficult because the immigration laws are massive, massive. So you have pardon all... from what? Exactly, and that's the problem. You can't do a blanket pardon because then you're pardoning people who were um, already deported. Yeah, what <laughs> age are you DACA? All right. Did you, did you come here at two, one, three, five, seven, all, all, yeah, eleven? All so of those what do you issues. say? All of those issues. But not only that, you have you have people, you have so many laws that you would have to pardon for that you'd have to cherry pick among the hundreds and hundreds of immigration laws. You have people who came here illegally, people who came here legally and then overstayed, people who failed to depart after a judge ordered them to depart, people who um, did identity theft to, in order to hide their identity, people who did social security fraud, tax fraud, um, gave false statements. So you have all of that mess on top of which you can only pardon, or the president can only pardon for criminal offenses. At but least, Judge, I don't think he's going to be doing this. I think if he's going to get either. the criminals out, and I think if by the time he gets to that, there'll be, I sense, some type of pathway to citizenship, which 65% of the American public wants. That's what I sense is going to happen. But first, he wants to secure the wall, which leads us to sanctuary cities. Mm -hmm. what, where's the president's power, and where are the mayor's powers? Well, the, well, the sanctuary city concept is kind of all subsumed together because you have people who, you know, Americans view it very differently because sanctuary cities will do two to several different things. I mean, there are some sanctuary cities who will just, oh, we pull you over in traffic and we realize you're not legal and we're not going to turn you over to the fence. But you haven't committed a crime, you're working, you're paying taxes and all stuff, we're just not going to do that. But most Americans are thinking, no, we're, we're, your sanctuary cities are protecting people who go out and commit a crime. They have them in jail. After, sure. they, after they finish with a conviction, then they don't turn them over to the feds and they let them go. And everybody's opposed to that and should be. Um, and some people are opposed to all of it. The feds really can't force the state to enforce federal law. They legally can't. But they you could know. hold the cash. And that's where the power is. In other words, if they go to a, a city and say, okay, no, you don't, you don't have to help us, you know, because typically you put an ICE detainer, basically you contact the local authority and say, you're holding so-and-so, we want you to hold them for us because we're going to deport them when you're done with them. And cities typically across the country cooperate. And then when they finish your sentence, they go, you're being held for ICE. And then they turn them over and, and that's what happens. They could very easily say, look, if you're not going to help us, we're not going to give you any federal funds. And that is a big motivating factor because these cities beg for federal money. Yeah, it all so, comes down to the money. Absolutely. So they, they have the power of the purse, even though they can't legally force the governor to, and they can't charge them. They, there's no crime in failing to assist sure. the federal government and force right. federal crime. Judge, all right. thanks for being here this morning. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Pride of Dade down. County. 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 <laughs> County. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, coming up, Senator Ted Cruz uh, seen going to meetings in Trump Tower this week, but does that mean he's got a role in the Trump White House. The senator is here live to react to some of those rumors. He's coming up next. I think he was just waving to me. And maybe they aren't the best of friends after all. What Bernie Sanders just said about Hillary Clinton's brutal loss. Next.